So glad you're here tonight. So thankful that you made the effort to be here. And for some of us, it takes more effort than others, and I'm glad that you're here. And I see a substantial splash of red among the crowd tonight. And that either means it's Christmas, which it's not, or that OU just won a big game, which I don't think that happened. Or it's a sweetheart banquet, which I think that's the case. Tonight's the sweetheart banquet for those who are, I think it was put this morning, 60 and better. That's a good way to put it, 60 and wiser. So I, uh, I know that you're always looking forward to that time of fellowship together, and I know the youth group does a great job of hosting that event, and they really uh, look at that as an opportunity for intergenerational involvement and service, and we're thankful for that. A woman woke up in the middle of the night and she realized her husband wasn't beside her so she put on her robe and she went downstairs and she found her husband sitting at the kitchen table with a cup of coffee in front of him, just staring out the window. And as she came down, she noticed that he even wiped a tear from his eye and she said, honey, what are you doing? What's wrong? He said, do you remember 20 years ago when we were dating and you were 16 and I was 19? She said, yeah. He said, do you remember that night that I brought you home and your dad met me at the door with a shotgun? She said, yeah. He said, do you remember when he shoved that shotgun in my face and he said, boy, you either marry my daughter or I'll see to it that you spend the next 20 years in prison? She said, yeah. He wiped another tear from his eye and he said, you know, I would have gotten out today. Love endures. Now that's probably not the best example. But it is a good reminder that when we choose to love, we realize, we, at least we should realize, that there are going to be some difficult times. There are going to be some challenges. That choosing to love isn't always easy. And when we think about a love that endures, it's a love that transcends our circumstances. It's a love that doesn't ebb and flow with emotions. It's a rugged love that sticks around no matter what happens. We're in a series we're calling Love Does. And there is, as some of you know, a book by Bob Goff with that same title, Love Does. And this series really isn't based on that book, although I highly recommend that book. It's a good book. But this series isn't based on that book. In fact, the concept didn't originate with Bob Goff. We're borrowing that title, but the concept originated with God himself. 1 John 3, 18, we read these words. Dear children, let us love with wor- not with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. You see what he says there? Inspired by the Holy Spirit, John says, you don't just love with words. Now, you could read that and say, now, wait a second. Words, they're not important. We don't express love with our words. And that's not what he's saying. He's not telling us that our words or our speech doesn't matter. Or that it's okay to say unloving or insensitive things. No, he's not giving us permission to be unkind with our words. What he is saying is that genuine love, godly love, Authentic love, enduring love, it's made evident much more by actions than words. You see, love is recognized more by what we do than what we say. It's seen in our actions. Anyone can talk a good talk, but love does. And so we're looking at some of the things that love does. Some of the actions of authentic love. And there seems to be a formula in Scripture and hopefully something that will come out throughout this series as we look at these different actions of love. And that is that God loves us this way. Whatever action we're talking about, that's the way God loves us. But it doesn't end there. He calls us to love others the same way. Every one of these active attributes of love represents the way God loves us, but also the way he calls us to love other people. It's interesting. God never really asks us to love others with any kind of love that he doesn't show us. 
maybe said a different way, God wants our love, our love for other people, to reflect his love for us. And God's love for us endures. You can go back to the Old Testament. You see a history of this enduring love of God. God chose the nation of Israel, and he set them apart from other nations. He chose to love them and continue to love them. And so in Deuteronomy 7, we have Moses gathering the people of Israel together, reminding them who they are, reminding them that God has chosen them, and that by choosing them, he has chosen to place his affection on them. He's chosen to love them. Listen to these words. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than all the other people, for you were the fewest of all the peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know, therefore, that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love for a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. God made a covenant with Israel. What type of covenant? A love covenant. He says it is a covenant of love. That means that God's love for Israel wasn't short-lived. It wasn't temporary. It didn't go in and out or up and down. It wasn't based on the ebbs and flows of the relationship or emotions. God's love for Israel would never fail. It was a love marked by faithfulness and expressed by his own protection of his people and provision for his people. The love of God acted on behalf of Israel. He set his affections on them. We think of affections as feelings, emotions. But for God, it wasn't about feelings or emotions necessarily. It was about this covenant love that he demonstrated through his actions. Well, was his love put to the test? Was his love for Israel ever challenged? Absolutely. So what happened in difficult times? What happened when it was hard to love? Did God still love? When Israel acted selfishly, when they chose to let outside influences pull their love away from God, their devotion even to other gods? What happened when Israel made it hard to love Israel? God continued to love. God's love endured. Just look at the story of Hosea. It's this wonderful living picture of God's enduring love for his people despite unfaithfulness. Now that's a love that endures. One of Israel's songs bears witness to God's enduring love. Maybe it's a song they sang in their assemblies. Jewish history tells us that this psalm, Psalm 136, the great Hallel, is what the Levites sang on very special occasions such as when the temple was inaugurated for Solomon. And you'll notice in this psalm this this repetition of the same phrase over and over, 26 times, his love endures forever. And so let's see if we can get a feel for what it might have been like in the assembly to recite the psalm in a responsive way, because that's how it's written, with a response And so I'll read the first part of each verse, and you come in with that phrase, the second part. It's there in italics. You better settle in, because it's not short. The psalmist writes in Psalm 136, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. Now wait a second. Did y'all not hear that sermon this morning? We talked about joy. Joy. That did not sound very joyful. His love endures forever. It sounded like Droopy the Dog. I don't know if y'all remember Droopy the Dog. You'll have to Google it up later, okay? Droopy the Dog, a little cartoon. That's what it sounded like. 
Imagine the assembly of God's people gathered together, and they are celebrating the acts of God among them that are happening in their day, and they're doing it also by looking back and seeing how God acted among them, that God has placed his affection on them, and they are overflowing with love and devotion. Let's try again. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Give thanks to the God of gods. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. To him who alone does great wonders. Who by his understanding made the heavens. Who spread out the earth upon the waters. Who made the great light great lights, the sun to govern the day, the moon and stars to govern the night, to him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt and brought Israel out from among them with a mighty hand and outstretched arm, to him who divided the Red Sea asunder and brought Israel through the midst of it. But swept Pharaoh and his army into the Red Sea. To him who led his people through the wilderness. To him who struck down great kings and killed mighty kings. Sion, king of the Amorites and Og, king of Bashan and gave their land as an inheritance, an inheritance to his servant Israel. He remembered us in our low estate and freed us from our enemies. He gives food to every creature. Give thanks to the God of heaven. Well done. Now, when you leave the assembly that day, and maybe tonight when you leave the assembly, and later you're doing dishes or you're watching TV or tomorrow you're driving in the car, what phrase is going to come back? Have you ever been in church and then later you start replaying one of the songs we sang in worship? Maybe tonight, maybe tomorrow, maybe later this week, at some sacred moment in your life, that phrase will come washing over your mind. His love endures forever. Don't ever forget that. Israel knew. They knew that God's love for them endured forever, despite what they did. Certainly, we in the New Testament church could sing the same song. In Christ, God's love for us endures forever. It was his enduring love that put Jesus on the cross. His undying love that caused Jesus to die. It's that same love that continually forgives us when we sin against him, when we defy his love, when we, like Israel, turn our backs on him. Romans 5 verse 8, Paul writes, but God demonstrates, he shows his love, the actions of his love, because love does. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When he had every reason to remove his love, Christ still loved. When it would have been easier, more convenient, and less painful, he still loved. When love was not returned to him, he still loved. And when love cost him so much, he still loved. That's the nature of enduring love. And God calls us to demonstrate that same type of love to other people. A love that perseveres. A love that is patient. One that forgives and restores. And that doesn't mean that it's a blind love. That it's a love that ignores injustice or becomes a doormat to be walked on. But what it does mean is it's a love that will not walk away easily. 
Enduring love finds reasons to stick with someone, a friend, a spouse, a fellow Christian, someone in need. You see, enduring love finds reasons to stick with them rather than finds reasons to leave. Enduring love continues to act when there is no love in return, when it's easier to bail, when common sense says to give up. Genuine love doesn't rise and fall with the changing tide of emotions. 1 Corinthians 13 is often read at weddings, and, and that's great, it should be. But it doesn't stand alone as though it was written as this separate poetic piece of literature for weddings or to be crocheted on pillows. It's part of the overall flow of Paul's letter that he's writing. Specifically, it connects chapter 12 that talks about giftedness among the body of Christ, the church, and chapter 14 that talks about doing worship together in an orderly way. And what holds it all together? Love. Love does. You see, we have different gifts and we're called to use them within the church. But the use of these gifts, even the use of these gifts in the assembly, it's not fueled by competition or selfishness or showiness or anything that threatens the body of Christ. Rather, the use of these gifts is motivated and marked by love, real love, godly love. You say, well, what kind of love is that? Paul tells us. Here's an excerpt from chapter 13. Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. But Paul says love doesn't pass away. Love can't be stilled. It endures. I think one of the best places to witness this type of of enduring love is in godly marriage. I'm thankful for the 35, 36 couples who spent this past weekend up here at the building for our marriage encounter. We had a great time encouraging each other and talking about God's design or God's vision for marriage. Well, in Matthew 19, Jesus is asked, is asked about marriage, and he, he calls them back to the original plan that God had in mind all along, all the way back in Genesis man and woman together forever. Matthew 19, verse 6. Jesus says, There are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let nothing, some versions say, or no one separate. You see, a marriage ordained by God is one in which husband and wife actively defend and protect the relationship. They resolve not to let anyone or anything separate them, including the anyone's in the marriage, themselves. They don't allow happiness to carry more weight than commitment. They don't believe the lie that love is primarily feelings and emotions rather than choices and commitment. They choose to love even when loving is difficult. They choose to forgive even when forgiveness seems impossible. As I consider this church family, we are so blessed to have the example of so many couples who demonstrate this type of love, an enduring love. And so tonight, I thought it would be just fitting to take a few minutes to recognize some of our marriages. It's a night of the sweetheart banquet. It's the week of people focusing on love. Guys, just a few more days until Valentine's Day, just a friendly reminder there. And so if you are here tonight and you have been married 50 years or more, 50 years or better, that's our phrase, 50 years or better, would you please stand right now? And I want to include those whose spouses may no longer be with us, but you were married that long before he or she passed away. 50 years or more. Please stand. Wow. Wow.
Now remain standing. I know the knees may be tired, the back may be sore, but remain standing. By the way, a a recent consensus said that only 6% of marriages are 50 years or longer. How about those who have been married 40 years or longer? Again, including individuals whose spouses are no longer with us, but you were married for 40 years before he or she passed away. 40 years or longer. Would you please stand? Now I'm going to throw you a curveball. We're going to go on the other end of the spectrum. All of those who've been married five years or less, five years or less, you stand. I see a few up here, up in the balcony. Remain standing. Now, those of you who are married five years or less, I want you to look around. I want you to see some of these older couples. These are the ones you need to be watching. These are the ones you need to be listening to. These are the ones you need to be spending time with to learn about life, to learn about marriage, about commitment, about enduring love. All right, this may be a cop-out, but if you've been married six to 39 years, (laughs) you can stand up now. Six to 39 years. Remain standing. Now, this may sound odd, but I also actually want to acknowledge those who are single among us. I don't want to leave you out or act like you are anything less because you are not married. And so would our single adults please stand as well. And the reason, one of the reasons that I want to do this is because God's call on us to love with a love that endures is not reserved only for marriage. This type of love should permeate every relationship we have, family, friends, within the church body. That's the way Christians are called to love. A love that endures is your calling. It's the calling of all of us. And so now... Would everyone stand? Including, I, know, I don't want to leave out our young people. So everyone stand. They're like, we're single. Do we stand? Do we not stand? I don't know. <laughs> Let's all stand. and Let's join together in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for your love for us. It does endure forever. And Father, there are so many times when we make loving us difficult. God, we are selfish. We are rebellious. We are defiant. Father, we are sorry. God, continue by your grace and mercy, continue to pour your love out on us because we need it so badly. And Father, as you pour your love on us, a love that never goes away, a love that endures, help us to receive that love, but then to channel it to other people. Father, those who are standing, who are married, I pray that you would bless their marriages, that you would help them to love like you love. Father, those who may not be married or not married yet or were formerly married, wherever we are, Father, help us in all of our relationships to reflect your love, to reflect the love of Christ. Father, it's our prayer that our love would endure. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his love. In his name we pray, amen. You can be seated. Thank you. Many of you know John and Glendale Norman. John passed away almost four years ago. That's hard to believe it's been that long. But Glendale's still going strong. I don't know if Glendale's here tonight. She loves the Sweetheart Banquet, but her health hasn't been too great lately, and she may not be here. Um, But right before John died, he and Glendale celebrated 73 years of marriage. 73 years. That's longer than many of us have been alive. They got married on May 5th, 1942 in Magnum, Oklahoma. Now remember the story that one day John thought it would be funny to bring home two baby skunks to Glendale. When he first showed up with them, she thought they were kittens. (laughs) They were stinky kittens. They were not kittens. 
She did not think it was as funny as he thought she would think it would be funny. (laughs) But I remember visiting them in their home probably about, I don't know, six or seven months before John actually passed away. And one of the things I asked them, I said, you you guys, at that time, it's 72 years. I said, you've been married 72 and a half years. What would you tell other couples? What advice would you give? What, What tips or secrets would you say to other people? And if you know them, you know they were very bashful to do that, you know, we don't, we don't know. And so I pressed them a little bit and finally got them to mention some specific things. Among other things, here's what they said. Be faithful to God and be faithful to the church together. They said have mutual interests, doing things together. Even learn to like each other's hobbies. They said this, don't dwell on each other's faults. So many people just think of their spouse's faults and never their good points. They said, compliment each other constantly. And finally, they said, simply follow the golden rule. Treat each other like you want to be treated. Words of wisdom. You know, I, I, see, a, I see a theme when, when I look at what they said. To look past self so that you can see and love the other person. And isn't that how God loves us? Sacrificial love. A rugged love that withstands our denial. Our unloving hearts and attitudes and actions. And yet, it's a love that looks beyond self and sees us and chooses to love us. It's a love that endures. That's the kind of love that God has for you. And that's the kind of love that he calls us to have for each other. Tonight as we wrap up, we want to offer an invitation, an opportunity for anyone who is ready to receive this love from God by embracing that love and saying, I want to live my life in a way that not only loves that way, but honors the name of Christ. Maybe tonight you're ready to be baptized into Christ. Or maybe it's encouragement you need. You need accountability. You need support. You need prayers. We'd be happy to help you in any way. We invite you to come as we stand and sing. Down.